I'll pass you over to Lawrence Kirk, who will begin his presentation. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Okay, thank you, Maurice, for inviting us this evening. Uh, thank you all for turning out on a rather miserable day. I'd like to talk about uh, SAIN, a company I work for, and particularly a, uh, an interesting project we've been working on. So, uh, what I would like to talk about uh, is just a quick introduction. We're going to see a video about a pilot project that we did for Porsche. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the technology that we do at SAIN particularly about our consensus mechanism. And then I'll explain how that technology has been used in the Porsche project. So we'll hopefully have the video now. Okay, thank you and thank you to Jesse for managing to balance the laptop and the microphone and get the sound working. It's fantastic. Okay. So to talk a little bit about our origins. So uh, my origins, uh, five years ago I was a developer uh, working on financial software uh, in the city of London. Uh, I had some interest in blockchain. I managed to mine about half a Bitcoin. Uh, but I uh, didn't know very much about cars. I didn't own a car. Uh, I then decided when, when Ethereum came out, I got very excited about this, uh, very interested in the potential that Ethereum had. 
uh, moved to Oxford and was studying at Oxford University. And by chance, I met uh, Leif Lundback, who is the founder of Zane and CEO. And he was doing some research looking at uh, consensus mechanisms and particularly the uh, mathematics behind uh, optimizing these, depending on various conditions. And I was very lucky that uh, when he decided to open his office in Berlin uh, here, uh, that he asked me to join and uh, head up the blockchain team. Thank you. Okay, so that was uh, February 2017. We incorporated here. Uh, a lot of the people who started saying had a background in the automotive industry, so it was uh, easy for us to work with companies like Daimler. Uh, and then in, uh, what this talk is going to be mainly about was the uh, results of a competition that happened last summer. So Porsche decided to hold a competition to start a pilot project for companies who would uh, start a project on the blockchain for them. I'm glad to say that out of over 120 applicants, uh, we won that competition to start a project. And these were the broad aims that they had uh, for what they wanted from their project. So uh, you'll have seen in the video uh, a lot of the functionality that they wanted. Um, locking and unlocking the car, allowing other people to access the car, allowing somebody to deliver packages to the boot, uh, but also recording traffic data, which is going to be very important uh, for a car, an automotive company to see how the cars are being driven. Uh, but as always with uh, blockchain applications, but particularly when you're talking about a, a luxury item like a, a Porsche, you want to have a great focus on safety. And uh, you want to be sure uh, that you uh, understand who is driving your car at any time. This presented some challenges, of course. So we only had three months in which to do the project, which is a very short time for any type of project. Uh, we had to really build a lot of the hardware or use uh, custom hardware in different ways. Uh, none of this was, uh, had been done before. We were trying to interface to the car system, so this is very low-level uh, systems work, uh, which we had to understand work out how to do this from scratch. And uh, we, were trying to we were trying to control the vehicle um, from a, a smartwatch or a mobile phone using Bluetooth and uh, Bluetooth low energy. Uh, the version we used wasn't uh, encrypted, the, the messages were not being encrypted, so we, has to, we had to develop our own encryption layer on top of that. And also there are, there are limits on the, the volume of uh, data that you can transfer, so that was another challenge. And finally, a, a general challenge to all blockchain systems, I think, is going to be the question of privacy and uh, compliance with GDPR. So we wanted to record data about the people driving the car, but we had to be very careful about the, whether that data was, could be seen as personal or not and how we were going to store that and how we were going to comply with these regulations. So, given that those were the challenges and uh, the, the aims of our project, how did we use the technology that we had to overcome those challenges? So I'll tell you a little bit now about the technology at Zane and uh, about our consensus mechanism. So you had a, a good introduction there um, about consensus mechanisms and um, particularly proof of work. So uh, we have a, a, a two-stage mechanism. So uh, we start with, um, this, this is talking about a, a private network actually. So uh, we may be moving to a public network, but this is, uh, we're talking about working on a private network here. And we have a number of nodes that are whitelisted. So these are ones that are allowed to participate in the mining process. From that uh, whitelisted set of nodes, we produce a committee. And we do this via a process called cryptographic sortition. And the committee, the size of the, that set of, uh, on the committee is much smaller than the set of all of the nodes. And that committee then runs proof of work to choose a leader who is then allowed to mine a block. Now, because that, the size of the committee is quite small, we can have a very low difficulty. Uh, we, we end up doing a lot less computation than we would if you were doing just a pure proof-of-work system. How we do this, how we select the committee is uh, very interesting and we uh, used some ideas from Algorand uh, for this. And it's basically relying on two aspects. So we have some data that is public and some that is private. The public data is a, a seed that is in every block and is, uh, we have a function that uh, creates a new seed from the seed in the previous block. And that is, so that is public, everybody can see that. 
Then we mix uh, in with that um, some private data. So that is the private key of the nodes participating in the network. And the way we do this is we have a verified random function based on the seed. This is all public still. And then we put that along with the private key of a node into a sortition function. The output of that function is a decision whether that node is accepted to be on the committee for that block. So if we look at the first block here, block number four, uh, we've taken the seed, we've worked out our, our, our VRF, put that into a sortition function, and two of the nodes on the left have been chosen to be part of the network. Now they know they're going to be, sorry, part of the committee. They know they will be part of the committee, uh, but no other nodes would know that. The third node there is not part of the committee. The benefit of this is that if you're attacking the system and you would like to take over the committee, you will not know which nodes will be chosen for that committee at any particular block. So if you want to take over the committee, you would have to attack all of the nodes that are part of the whitelist. Okay. Uh, mathematically, uh, this is a simplified version, but um, the seed is chosen uh, based on the seed in the previous block. So R here is the block height, and we're just taking a signature of the previous block to produce the next seed. Uh, so um, that's quite simple. Um, the sortition function itself is a little more complex, so I'll just go through it very quickly. The part on the right-hand side, uh, this is a ratio, so the value n there is the target size of the committee that we want. And the, the number underneath, that is the size of the total number of nodes in the network uh, that are whitelisted. So we're using that ratio um, to then decide which nodes will be chosen. Well, we do that by the left-hand side, so, so far we've had all public information. On the left-hand side, we take, again, some more public information, the block height, uh, the seed. But we, we do something private now. So we take the signature of that information um, based on the, the signature of a private key for a particular node. So then that is a private information. That gets put into a, a hash and uh, put into a decimal, so it becomes a number between 0 and 1. If that number is less than the ratio, then you'll be chosen for the committee. Otherwise, you're not in the committee. So quite a simple computation, uh, not computationally expensive. Okay. So in order to do all this, um, we decided uh, we would have to, we would take a fork of the Go Ethereum client. We did this after the Byzantium hard fork. And to the, to the vanilla client, we added some extra features. So we added our consensus mechanism. We also could reduce the size of the, the data set that is used for the proof of work uh, hash. Um, we reduce that down to 64 megabytes from a gigabyte. So this is, much, this is then much easier to use on devices uh, that are constrained in uh, terms of resources. We also had to do something because we were primarily working on private networks here. And that is that there's a problem that if you have a, in a private network, uh, there is less incentive to act honestly. Uh, and it's possible that if there was a miner who was, uh, had been removed from the whitelisted set of nodes, he might try to impersonate uh, one of the approved set of nodes. So he might send out a block pretending that that block came from a miner that had been whitelisted. So to prevent that, we make sure that the miners sign the block when they are produced, and then this is, can be checked by all the nodes that accept that block. Okay. If you are familiar with setting up a... Uh, a private network on Ethereum um, and starting a Genesis block, you will perhaps recognize uh, the config file for that. So I'm sorry, it's probably hard to see at the back there. Um, but basically, just the part I wanted to show is that we added some extra contracts into the Genesis block, and these are there providing our access control layer. So these contracts are then available for every client, uh, and they are used then to whitelist nodes, remove nodes if they have been misbehaving. Now, to talk about the, the project itself, uh, we collaborated with a couple of teams as well as Porsche themselves. We worked with the Porsche Digital Lab in Berlin and Spin Lab uh, from Leipzig, uh, an accelerator. Uh, I should say at this point that although I was involved doing some of the architecture and setting up some of the in infrastructure for this project, most of the hard work was done by my colleagues and I should credit them for that. So some of them are here this evening. So. I'd like to thank for that. Okay. The system architecture itself, so basically we have some uh, device, this could be a mobile device or maybe a smartwatch. 
that has a, a Bluetooth module that then can connect to the device that we have in the car. Um, we can also connect via Web3 uh, to our, our Zane network. So here you have uh, some full clients uh, that are on, uh, on AWS, for example. We also have that then connected to some IPFS nodes because we're going to collect data and store that in IPFS. And initially, we would also have some extra processor clients, some extra mining, because we are, uh, until the vehicle network has reached a critical size, we want to make sure we have sufficient hash power. In the vehicle itself, and I'm, I'm sorry this hasn't come out very well on this thing, but we have a, a Bluetooth module that is accepting transactions from our mobile client. This is talking to a node running uh, in the vehicle that is then talking to the rest of our same network. We also have a, a module that is uh, running Whisper, so we're going to send the data that we're collecting via the Whisper protocol uh, back to our blockchain and get that stored in IPFS. And then these are connected to a Canvas module, so this is the module that uh, connects to the Canvas in the car, and this is how we interact with the in-car systems. So this acts in two ways, both to record data from the car and also to allow us to perform actions, so to allow the door to be unlocked or the boot to be opened. Uh, so for this next slide, I won't go into a huge amount of detail because there are a lot of keys on there. This was just to show you a little bit about the, uh, how, we, um, how we're approaching the permissioning. Um, so it really is very, very straightforward. Um, it's sort of very typical of uh, the ideas you usually use in cryptography. We have public private key pairs uh, generated on our mobile devices and in the vehicle, and this allows them to verify the identity of each other. And we use nonces to make sure that we don't get any replay attacks. We also have uh, some symmetric keys in the vehicle uh, that are then used to sign data that it will then go into IPFS. So this is the, the driving data that we're collecting. And then we have some smart contracts, and these are holding, uh, for example, a key from the mobile device that is then associated with an Ethereum address. So this is how we keep track of an address um, associated with a mobile uh, device. Um, since we did that, uh, we also have another way now that we're thinking of using for, to simplify key management, and that is proxy re-encryption. So I'll just mention this, this technology briefly, uh, but it is uh, very useful. So the idea behind this is that uh, we have Alice and Bob, who you, well, you met one half of the partnership uh, in the previous talk. Uh, Alice here is going to sign uh, some text. and she, uh, So say this is some data that she has, uh, perhaps relating to the driving behavior, or perhaps relating to her ownership of the car and how it has been serviced. She signs this, uh, encrypts it with her public key, and so it becomes ciphertext. Um, so at this point, only she can decrypt this data which is fine for her, she knows it's safe, she has control over it, but obviously it's not very useful. She wants to be able to give access to that data to other people. In particular here, she wants to give access to this to Bob. And so the way we do this with proxy re-encryption is that she creates a re-encryption key. To do this, she uses her private key and the public key of Bob. And with this, she can then sign the already encrypted text with this proxy re-encryption key, so that gets re-encrypted into the, the, the state you see on the right. So at no point here does she have to reveal her private key, or does she have to reveal the clear text uh, that she had initially. So once she's re-encrypted it with this key that is specific to Bob, then he can decrypt that final data with his private key. So this is the means by which Alice can allow Bob to see, uh, to decrypt this data, to see the data in clear text. And the proxy part there is used that you can set up proxy nodes so that Alice does not have to be online to do all of this. She can grant access to the keys via the proxy. And Bob can go and go to the proxy to get the keys. Okay. To uh, look at the hardware, this photo hasn't come out great, but we also used a Raspberry Pi uh, here, uh, which we customized uh, heavily uh, when we were doing the project initially. Um, so we used a, uh, the top of the range Pi at the time. A uh, very standard thing, so it had uh, one gig of RAM. So you can run a uh, standard Ethereum node on this without too much trouble. Now we're moving uh, to getting our, our systems onto much smaller devices and devices that are far more constrained. 
Uh, we did have the problem that we, um, we were customizing this, we're adding what's called hats to the Pi, the Pi hats. Uh, and we had a problem that we didn't have enough pins for this, so we had to be careful how we juggled that, the pin allocation. And then on the, on the software side, uh, on Ethereum, uh, we've developed a number of smart contracts and libraries. The contracts would hold the car state, so whether the car was unlocked or not, and the permissions that the car was using, um, who would be allowed to access it at what time, for example. Allow, we have a contract that allows users to register uh, on the system and register their key and then get a, an Ethereum address from that. And also we have the user history, so that shows what that user has been doing, who has been accessing their car, for example. Uh, Porsche wanted to record certain pieces of data. Uh, this is just a small set of the, uh, what they would ideally like. And this is, I guess, fairly standard. It's the sort of thing you would expect. So location, speed, fuel level, mileage, also outside temperature. Um, obviously, the, you need to know what the, perhaps what the weather is, whether uh, the driving conditions are going to need to change because of that. So this is the data that we took uh, and would then be passed on to IPFS. And we have a nice uh, little front end to uh, show this data. And again, sadly, it hasn't come out very well. The top part shows, uh, had a map that showed uh, the route that a car was taking as it was driving that we collected from uh, the data we had collected. Uh, the bottom graph is a chart showing the speed of the car versus the uh, fuel level in the tank. Okay. So that was the, the basic project uh, that we had, but of course that was just uh, the basic uh, thing and since we have completed that project, obviously we can then expand and build on that. So now we are looking, um, along with our AI team, at distributed machine learning for autonomous driving. So if you're looking at autonomous driving, these are generally, this is often trained in very constrained environments. So you do this in Silicon Valley or in a, a city where the roads are well defined and you have very nice road signs. But that is not the whole picture. And if you want to then take your car to somewhere, say a rural setting or somewhere uh, that has very badly uh, bad roads, um, your, your car will perhaps not perform so well. So our idea is that we will get the cars to train uh, in whatever setting they are in. And then because uh, they are connected via a blockchain, they can securely pass that training data around to each other. And the, each car can then benefit from the experience of every other car in the network by retraining on the data that every other car has, has gained. The second uh, thing that we can develop, uh, we can build upon, is integrating with third-party systems. So as you saw in the video, we could collect packages from, say, DHL and have them delivered to your car. But also we could uh, work with insurance providers so they could be uh, giving you a better insurance rate because they can see the driving data that has been collected for you uh, and we'll be happy to uh, accept that you're a safer driver. Okay, so uh, in summary, I'd just like to say this is a very exciting and interesting project. Of course, initially, because it's great fun hacking something like this, a uh, beautiful car. Um, also, I was very privileged to work with some very talented people, uh, so I'm very grateful to all of those. This is uh, some of our team. Uh, but that's it. Um, thank you for your attention. If you would like to uh, contact us, we'd love to hear from you if you're interested in, in what you've, uh, which you've heard about this project or you'd like to talk to us generally about what we've been doing. You can contact us uh, as, as these addresses. But also we have a couple of developers here in the audience. You can come talk to me. I'll talk to Jesse, our marketing manager, at the end. And finally, yeah, thank you for your attention. I uh, probably have time for a couple of questions. Yeah, got this. Um, what blockers do you use for the private network? What's sorry, what? The blockers limit for high limit for the private network? Uh, I think it was just, just uh, yeah. So he was asking for the 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 limits that we were using on the, the private network. So I think we just used a standard one from uh, Ethereum at the time. Yeah, using so the six six meg gas whatever. Yeah. Hey. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, do you need the cars to be online for the consensus to work? Okay, so a uh, very important point that I completely forgot to mention uh, was the offline mode. So 
Of course, uh, this is going to be important for you. If you, uh, you go on vacation, you go somewhere remote and you get out of your car, you don't want your car to then be locked and unable to be accessed because you're no longer connected to the internet. So we have an offline mode as well. So the idea is that the connection to the car from your device is via Bluetooth, which you will always be able to do. Uh, and then the permissions that uh, your car uh, will use, um, if, if possible, it will go to the internet and download, get the latest permissions into the contract. But if it can't connect to the internet, it will just use the permissions that it had. And then also we have a timeout so that if after a certain time it cannot connect and cannot get more permissions, it will then not allow access to, say, third party people, but it will always allow access to the owner. So, yeah, there's definitely an offline mode. Yeah. And for the validators, for the consensus itself? So, for the consensus itself, that uh, is part of the, the way the committee works. It's probabilistic. So, we give a target size for the committee. And then, uh, Obviously, um, if some of those are missing, um, they won't be able to do proof of work. But if you have a sufficiently large target size, uh, then that, that will be fine. Yeah. I think you were first. Yeah. Yeah. So why would you need proof of work at all? Uh, because uh, you have a predetermined list of uh, whitelisted nodes in the network. And um, so can't you just set the difficulty to zero? OK, so the question was, why do we need proof of work at all? Yeah, so um, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, I mean, proof of work um, is very well understood. Mathematically, you can reason about it. It's uh, a very good, very good system from that point of view. Um, if we just use, say, the sortition and just worked out a committee, we would still have to find one leader from that. And so trying to get the committee size of one each time would be virtually impossible. Um, what you're saying, perhaps, though, I think is would, is, would we do something more like proof of authority, where we just whitelisted some nodes and we did a round robbing amongst those? Well, uh, we're not, uh, although we uh, do have these whitelisted nodes, we do not necessarily trust them. It is possible there could be malicious behavior. So we still want the option to be able to remove miners from uh, that whitelist. So it's possible that there will be uh, miners uh, that will be removed from the list and will no longer be able to partake um, because of, there's been malicious behavior. Um, even though it's a private network, and the, um, we can still get the possibility of attacks from uh, internal, internal attacks. So we still want to take account of that. Yeah. already solved by the, the whitelist of nodes, right? Uh, so it's really just to get a leader out of our committee that, that, we, that we do then the proof of work and that we can do it in a fair enough random fashion. Yeah. I think this guy's next. Yeah. So my question was very related to uh, IPFS and I was wondering why you decided to use that rather than a more like traditional centralized database. Like for example, if you had like IPFS nodes running on the cars, um, and also what challenges that poses once you want to query that data compared to other yeah, traditional Okay, so yeah, so why are we using IPFS? Uh, we wanted a decentralized uh, system and um, it's the IPFS and Ethereum pattern is one that is quite well established, I think, and quite, quite liked, so we, we wanted to use that. Um, and the nodes on the car as well, yeah, so they, um, we're still passing it back to IPFS nodes in the cloud at this point. Um, because we can have a large amount of data. The problems that we have with that are probably around privacy, so we have to be careful um, that we anonymize the data sufficiently and that we have it sufficiently encrypted um, so that other people cannot, cannot uh, read this data. Yeah. Two, more. two more questions, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, one of these two, yeah. Whichever. So. Um, for the data privacy, um, law requirements. Uh, how do you work around the, the, the new right to forget data? Okay, so this is obviously a big problem for blockchains uh, where data is meant to be uh, immutable. So um, the way we do that, so if we, we're dealing uh, with encryption uh, and IPFS, we can effectively uh, decide to uh, remove uh, data from IPFS by allowing it to be garbage collected and then making sure it hasn't been pinned on any node. But then because we have it encrypted and we can hold uh, keys, if we're using uh, the, the key management uh, that I was, the re-encryption key management, because we hold those keys, we can also burn those keys. So not only have we decided that the data has gone, we can also remove the encryption key for that data. Well, that's the best way we thought of, yeah. I think, oh, okay. I think this guy was next, no? Or, well. <laughs> um, yeah, just go back to the consensus. I was wondering yeah. why you 
didn't choose to use an existing um, Byzantine fault tolerant consensus mechanism, like the PBFT, for example? Um, yeah, so uh, this really came out of the, the research that uh, Life had done, our founder had done um, originally. Um, so he'd, he'd uh, been looking at various uh, PBFT systems and found that uh, they just were not secure enough. Um, so he wanted uh, the security of something like proof of work, but then something that was much more energy efficient. So that's why we, we took uh, the, the, the um, combination of the two. Uh, he found that he could easily hack into, into these and uh, yeah, uh, do malicious things, overcome them. I mean, yeah, so, no sense. Okay? So, thank you very much for this second great presentation.